Hi, it's Kevin Reynolds, and welcome to tonight's broadcast. I'm so glad that you joined us. I have a special guest, Andrew Munn. And before we get started conversing and asking him questions, and I hope that you'll bring any questions that you have about nutrition as well, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. We are going to dive into some deep conversation about the importance of bee nutrition, how that affects their longevity, their immune system, things that we can do um, with products or things that aren't products that we often think about. And there's just a lot to unpack here. I'm super excited because one of the things that we don't have a lot of options for in beekeeping is products that shield our bees naturally and that's boosting their immune system which is the best thing that we can give our bees is a healthier immune system to be able to fight themselves the pathogens and pests that we have in our hives so a lot to unpack here thanks for coming on andrew andrew is the developer of apis biologics and it is a product that beekeepers can now use to mix into their foods. And Andrew, my first question to you is a lot of people are calling this Canadian rocket fuel instead of Apis Biologics. And, um, you know, why do you think that they call it rocket fuel for? Well, there's a gentleman west of me, uh, Ian Stepler, and he uh, kindly gave it that nickname probably a couple, what a year ago now, I think. Well, he's been calling it that longer than, than a year, but, uh, it made its way onto YouTube about a year ago. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, everyone likes the sound of uh, something like a rocket. You know, most of us guys, we're, we're still kids on the inside, and we like all that kinds of yeah. stuff. But the Ian really likes the product, and he's the one that um, gave me a heads up on this thing that you were developing and you have been trial trialing it out for a while it's so even though it's a new product on the market how long have you actually been working on developing these nutritional supplements this is my ninth ninth year working on this project which is crazy because i i spend a lot of my time trying to see who's doing what in the industry and obviously it's a it's there's a lot of people around the a world doing different things, but you've kind of kept a really low profile for a while. Um, is according to what I understand um, from people that know you and respect you, that you really wanted to test the products first and get them where they needed to be, um, so that you could make sure that the the product was great and that it would actually serve um, honeybees and, and the beekeeper. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, came in this this space. You know, it's kind of been. It's been a little lackluster uh, for for quite some time, and, and I think beekeepers just by default were a very skeptical bunch, um, just just because we really haven't had a lot of functional tools presented. And I, I was in that in that very situation myself. That's kind of what you know sparked you know this interest uh, and kind of pointed me down this path is because I didn't have the functional nutritional tools that I needed, and. I really didn't have an end game of producing a product, you know, for sale per se. Uh, I was a beekeeper, sideline beekeeper that was doing double pollination events uh, here in New Brunswick. So blueberries home for a week and a half, try to recuperate them, regrade them, and then take them to cranberries. And they were getting hammered. Um, and I was trying to formulate feeds that would make them a little bit more robust or resilient, you know, through that schedule right Absolutely. Well, and as beekeepers, that's one of the components I think that we have not had some good options for. So we have a saying, great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition. Now, great queens, uh, we can do our best to make sure that they are fed very healthy and that the cells are, are nice and filled with royal jelly. But then after that, we have to make sure that there's plenty of drones. And even if there is plenty of drones, we just have to hope that the magic happens. Um, when it comes to mite control, we do have um, several products out there, but really in the nutrition game, there are pollen patties and there are a few liquid supplements, but I would argue that we're pretty, um, we're pretty limited. A lot of the supplements, the liquid ones or the, the powders really focus more just uh, stimulating the bees or keeping the syrup from fermenting, or they're a 
product that's an essential oil, which can have some positive impacts, I believe, if there's already some issues in the colony. Um, a lot of them work like an antibiotic from what I've studied. I mean, that's a lot of a lot of like stuff like thymol and, and those things are killing bacteria. They're used in a lot of Listerine for our mouthwash. They're used in sprays in organic agriculture. And, but we don't really have any products that target what's in the real pollen and what's in the natural nectar until this. And so one big question before I ask you um, to describe kind of what makes your product so special and so different is a lot of the confusion is uh, people think that there's only one product out there. But I have two packets right here. One is biocontrol and one's bioactivator, and would you mind kind of breaking down um, why there's two and what they're for? Yeah, and maybe I'll maybe I'll lead that response with with an apology to to your audience, uh, Cayman, or or any of our customers. Uh, those names are not the most memorable or the easiest to distinguish apart. That, that's for sure. Uh, but they do have some background meaning um, to to me. Uh, so I guess it's an inside joke, but. Uh, a biocontrol uh, ultimately was an attempt to mimic the nutritional profile of floral nectar. And bioactivator uh, was an analysis of the composition of pollen uh, and formulated to uh, use commercial pollen supplements as the backbone to bring, uh, basically provide nutrients that aren't currently being addressed, uh, but to also bring nutrients that are present in commercially available cells up to what I refer to as activation uh, thresholds. So if you can remember bioactivator pollen, biocontrol nectar. I got you. So the the activator, you said it was to, you know, basically fortify the available pollen subs that we have. And and if you look at the sub the pollen substitute that we have, um, and I've heard this referred for many, many years, is pollen substitute really needs to be called pollen supplement because it does not substitute pollen at all, and I think nobody would argue that real pollen is is gold. I mean, it's it's the it's the best thing that bees can can get for proteins, uh, and mineral content and all that kind of stuff. Protein, but myself and others, we experience periods of dearth. That's the toughest part of beekeeping in Tennessee is July, August, and September. Those are the months to conquer here. If we can control the mites and we can deal with the robbing and help our bees nutritionally thrive, that's what I keep telling people in this region is we need to focus on those months, not on just mite control, but nutritionally. And so this is where I'm just like, wow, this is something that I can use to kind of give my bees a stronger immune system. So these two products here, we just call it as a slang rocket fuel. We had you at the conference this year, and you were gracious enough to come all the way down from Canada and talk to a lot of the folks. And one of the the questions that I had the most besides um, if there is two products is – you know, how to use this. So I'm pretty sure the biocontrol is pretty cut and dry. I mean, it's just it, on the on the label, you mix it with some liquid, the, the appropriate amount that's designated on the label. But with your bioactivator that's for pollen patties and mixing, what's kind of um, your your take on, on that? Because there's some people watching this that are not in the U.S. or Canada, maybe they're in other countries where they don't have access to Ultra B dry sub or any type of dry formulated powder, and they're having to, you know, piecemeal ingredients in their countries to make a patty. Is this something that could still be added to that and bring value? I think so, Kanan. Um, Those nutritional profiles are from the nutritional profile of floral pollen. So, I mean, ideally you would have like a backbone, you know, protein source, uh, and you're going to need a backbone lipid fraction. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually did get some overseas questions just recently uh, about how to, there was a gentleman that was feeding uh, both, like he didn't feed syrup and patties. He was feeding 
like a big sugar cake kind of mix, like mixing up four or four kgs at a time. And I kind of walked him through some custom, you know, blending of biocontrol and bioactivator to, you know, to accommodate that. Right. So I think it's a tough one to answer without knowing the exact, uh, the exact profile, because I do like, I try to be precise in my responses, but in short, yes, there's an application for it. Awesome. Well, that's, that's what I've kind of gathered. One of the things that I've, I've, so far I've heard really good results and I've had good results with the, uh, your bioactivator for pollen patties that were mixed in with the global patties that we had at the conference. So for those of you who came to Hive Life, maybe you were some of the folks that took advantage of the really good discounted prices that we have. And I want to say thanks, Andrew, for working with us on that. That was um, really awesome to be able to get a high-end professional formulated patty. Um, and we were able to get them in bulk, and all of us were able to save and and I've used that a lot myself, and I've got nothing but great things to say about how the bees are consuming the patties. And um, I just think that it's awesome that um, we have a more complete patty option um, now. So, when well, I would I'd like to uh, thank you for that, Cayman. That was a that was a good opportunity for us to come down to the U.S. and meet some U.S. beekeepers, and that was a really cool experience uh, for me. Uh, there was a a lot of beekeeping energy packed into a weekend. Oh, well, thanks. Sure. Uh, we we just we just love um, you know folks like you who are trying to bring new things and, and hard you know hard, these are hard questions that you're asking. You know these these nutritional profiles aren't something you can sit down in a day or two and figure out what do bees yep. need. And speaking of what do bees need, so you and I have talked in the past about there's some tips and tricks that that any beekeeper uh professional or hobby beekeeper could can be using to to make the nutrition and and their operation better um, do you mind sharing some of that with us today sure i i think one of the most practical things that that people can do came in outside of the context of the, these two products is the the literature is is stacking up more and more uh th there's research publications published every year on this when if you mix your patty uh, yourself, paying attention to the fatty acid profile in that pollen substance supplement uh, is really important. If the lipid fraction gets skewed more towards an omega six dominant profile, it's it's contraindicated. And there's multiple research publications to, to to back that statement up. And I I know it's really common to use canola and corn oil and the oils that are just cheap cheap off the shelf. Uh, but those oils are they have beneficial fatty acids within their profile uh, but they're the minor fractions in their compositional profiles omega-3 or alpha linolenic uh, acid needs to be the dominant fatty acid in the lipid fraction of your pollen supplement once you've achieved that uh, to make uh, omega-3 the dominant lipid fraction you should make some attempt to get palmitic acid uh, at, as a close number two. And then the omega-6 fraction or the alpha linoleic uh, fraction uh, should be a number three. And then it's oleic and steric that, that follow that respectively. Um, we, I just did a discussion with Ian Stepler a couple of days ago where we kind of walked through an easy way to achieve that. And basically, rather than an easy substitute to make is ditch the canola oil and the corn oil and use flax oil. The ideal concentration seems to be two to four percent of ALA or the omega-3 fraction. So if you're going to mix at a six percent total, uh, you would want you know two to four percent of that to be with flax oil, and then your other oils would make up the rest of that, uh, you know, six percent or eight percent, right? So let's say you're a hobby beekeeper, and you know you you don't have the time, and and also maybe the the pocketbook to make the perfect patty, you know, and get, get it super balanced. If, but I have some recipes on my website where we actually use some oils. A lot of times we have just, I didn't know any better. So we recommended vegetable or canola oil or, or, you know, corn or whatever, you know, is, is affordable because we were trying to keep the cost down. But now, yep. um, if there was one oil, so you're, you're mixing up some patties, maybe you have some ultra B, and one of the re recipes that we use, it's 
um, granulated sugar, it's um, ultra B powder, and then it is um, a little bit of oil to keep it from drying out, and a few other odds in it. There's a little, just a tiny bit of water in there. And what type of oil would you use if you had to pick one? Flax oil. Flax oil. Now, if you didn't have access to that, what would be number two? Oh, that's a tough, tough question. <laughs> I do have access to it, though. <laughs> it, it, I've, I've, I have heard that coconut oil could be good or could be bad. It's expensive, though. Um, it is, yeah. So I, I do use a little bit of coconut oil, Cayman, but not so much from a nutritional perspective, more from uh, an antimicrobial uh, perspective. Uh, so it's common to not all samples of pollen, but it's pretty common to for honeybees to have exposure to lauric acid, which is mm -hmm. the antimicrobial fatty acid. And uh, there, there's a few others, but that's the dominant antimicrobial uh, fraction. But yeah, that's why I use a little bit of coconut oil. I, I see. So, and, and that probably div diversifies the the acid profile a little bit, the fatty acids. Um, I imagine maybe. Um, yep, it does. It, it does. There's not an over, like from a nutritional perspective, coconut oil is not, you know, it, it's not overly impressive, but, uh, but lauric acid is why I use it. Lauric acid and consumption rate. These so, really seem to be attracted to uh, coconut. Interesting. So, um, so a fellow spirit of toad asked a question. I think you've pretty much answered, but we'll go ahead and hit it. Um, I'm curious what oil to add to help with the patty drying out. So, Flax oil sounds like the ideal oil to use. Couple, couple little tricks there. Yeah, absolutely. Flaxseed oil, but I'm also a big fan of that, adding uh, phospholipids to my pollen supplement. This is breaking this information here first, game. This is another little uh, yes. <laughs> another little tweak people can do. I'm a big fan of using uh, lecithin uh, in my uh, pollen pollen supplements. Uh, less so, of it. So it, 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 yeah it gives you a really good consistency but also in the in the pollen grain itself lecithin is actually a fairly significant uh, fraction of that that overall composition and within lecithin there's a bunch of compounds like phosphatidylcholine uh, phospholipids basically that are really important for uh, for honeybee physiology interesting so Maybe when this is over, um, I know you have a lot on your plate, but if you wouldn't mind sending me um, maybe something shareable on if there is a, ra a, a ratio for a few of these products that you prefer, because I know you're verbally saying them and people can go back and watch the video, but um, perhaps that's something yeah. that we can have a kind of like an itemized list of, of ways yeah. that... That would be awesome. I, I, I prefer to do that because when I'm shooting from the hip verbally, I usually make mistakes and like to correct myself later. So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. So, um, Spirit of Toad said, I was going to try soy lecithin, but I was concerned about indigestibles. So, is it is there dis different types of less lecithins, or is that the, the preferred one? Um, what What's kind of your opinion on that? So, that's the one that you're going to find most readily just because there's so much soy being grown. So, mm -hmm. Soy flour is known to have, you know, there's there's some research on, you know, some of the uh, uh, carbohydrate fractions in uh, in soy, but soy lecithin is a little bit different. Like the molecular structure, they they go through a, a it's a it's a fractionation process, so the the molecules are different. So the carbohydrates are separated from the phospholipids, and you're just kind of left over with the phospholipids. So wouldn't be super concerned about the indigestibles in soy lecithin. Um, Sunflower lecithin is, is an alternative if you wanted to stay away from soy. It's a little more expensive, but. It's awesome. Awesome to have some options because opinions, opinions and beekeeping abound. And a lot of people like to do things a little bit different. Andrew, Andrew. do you have much contact with Karen Thurlow? I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that name. Are you, Andrew? Yes, I am. So Karen Thurlow is the new chief, uh, chief provincial apiarist uh, here in New Brunswick. She's just taking over recently for Fletcher Colpins, uh, a guy that I hold in high regard. I've worked with Fletcher a lot over the years. Um, but I met Karen. She came up from Maine one year and was putting on a, a course in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And she actually taught me how to use a microscope. And so I came home from Karen's course there in Fredericton, and 
I bought my first microscope and haven't looked back since. I've been smashing bee guts avidly ever since that day. So, <laughs> oh, no. so yeah, I, I, I do know Karen. I have a lot of respect for her. She's a very knowledgeable beekeeper. Awesome. Well, I'll, that's a name that I'll have to remember. Um, you know, there's, again, going back to, you know, how is it, why do I like this product? Um, and, and what do I think it can help me for? And before I say that, um, thanks Dave Dwyer, who's one of our consistent supporters of our YouTube channel. Um, I appreciate you, Dave, and we look forward to bringing you uh, more information, whether it's from us or whether for someone like Andrew who specializes in something we really don't know much about. Uh, but we're here to learn with you guys, and thanks for supporting this, Dave. So for me, the biggest issues that we always have, if, if we can get bees through the winter and we get into February and we start getting the maple pollens, and, and as long as there's not a, a bad start to the year, and a bad start for new beekeepers would be we get the maple flow or, or maybe we don't some years we don't um you know poor weather uh, it's it's really from a year to year things are totally different and there were beekeepers telling me back in january and february because we had such a warm winter this year oh man everything's going to be so early and it started out that way we have been so cool the last month typically at this point we've had several days in the 80 degree fahrenheit we we we're in the 60s um, it is cooler. Um, things can change rapidly. And I have seen years where we have not needed any pollen patties for our bees. I've seen years where if it wasn't for pollen patties, financially our operation would have taken a large hit. And our nucleus colonies that we sell would have not been ready in time. And so these supplements are really important. And when it comes to those critical moments you know, having something that can either um, be a weapon or a tool to, to use um, is, is an exciting option to me. And and I'll be honest, I'm one of those guys that's extremely skeptical of anything new, Andrew. Um, there's, there's so much product in beekeeping that is introduced that is just to make a quick buck. And so that leads me to one of my next questions is, you know, I look at the back of Bioactivator, and I mean, there's proline, there's words that are 20 letters long back here. And, you know, I'm from Tennessee. We, we don't know how to say anything that long. Um, so, you know, what can you tell us about, you know, I, I know there's certain things you can't say probably, but what, what can you tell us that, y I know you're trying to mimic pollen, but what, what makes pollen so good and can you tell us a little bit of why pollen's good and why your product is is trying to fulfill those and empty gaps in our nutritional system for bees yeah sure i mean pollen's very complex what but maybe i'll i'll qualify something before i answer that i'm nine going on my 10th year into this exercise and i'm convinced that i have more questions now uh, than i did when i started uh, it's a very deep rabbit hole. Uh, honeybee nutrition is, is quite complicated. Um, we are committed to the cause and we'll continue to improve these formulations as we get um, more field validation. Um, and we work within the regulatory framework with Health Canada and the FDA. We, we have some very uh, interesting additions to bring, bring to the table, uh, but it, take, it takes time uh, to do that. These formulations are a lot more complicated on my spreadsheets and in the in-house R&D than what you're seeing there. Uh, but those uh, additions will come uh, uh, over time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess the, uh, the primary objective is uh, we, as beekeepers, we're all, we, we experience it. When a pollen and a nectar flow happens simultaneously, your colonies turn on. You know, if there's a sickness or, you know, a, just a general state of weakness in that apiary, everything seems to improve when that happens. And, you know, making those very basic fundamental observations, you know, I, I wanted to know what is it about floral nectar and what is it about floral pollen that produces that effect? Because you, you produce a stimulation effect when you're feeding, you know, basic pollen patties and you produce a stimulation effect feeding sucrose syrup at the same time, but it's not the same. Uh, it, it's just not, not the same effect. That, that's really kind of what made me start start to ask those questions. 
And then when I started to ask those questions, I realized that, wow, you know, this, this is going to be a task. There's 252, 257 uh, bioactive compounds in pollen. Uh, it's, it's not a, it, yeah, it, there's quite a bit going on there. Um, so when you're looking through the list of, uh, you know, compounds in order of precedence in those formulations, I guess, first and foremost, we wanted to fill in the amino acid gaps. Um, currently, um, commercially available pollen supplements are being formulated uh, based on the foundational work that they group that uh, met many decades ago. And I, I think that's kind of where we, as foundational and, and as important as that work was, and it's kind of taken us to the place that we're at right now, I think our focus on studying bees instead of studying pollen and nectar has kind of let us go down, you know, we're 100, and 100 plus years deep, you know, into this study of honeybee nutrition. And I, I think, I wouldn't call it an error, uh, but there's limitations to taking honeybees into a lab and studying bees when you're trying to understand what their nutritional requirements are. Um, for me, not having, wa wanting answers to those questions, but not having a research team and unlimited funding, you know, I was a sideline beekeeper, you know, with the curiosity of these things. So I had to take a different approach. I had my methodology had to be a lot more practical. And really, I just think it, it's as simple as that, like that shift in methodology, like it, instead of waiting for mechanistic research publications to say that compound X produces, you know, physiological mechanism Y uh, in a honeybee, you know, 250 biologically active compounds deep into pollen, like will be another 500 years, uh, you know, if we continue down that down that path. So for me, it was just a mu it was much more logical to say what's in pollen, what's in nectar. Let's ID them. Let's quantify their concentrations, and let's source them, uh, and let's feed our honeybees that, and let's see what happens. Uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of of that. A lot of respect for uh, you, you know, championing uh, those hard questions and and continuing. Uh, you and I have talked a little bit about the things that you're still looking into to make things even better and, and possibly bring more to the industry. And that's what I love about, you know, a, a business model versus um, a university, which universities definitely are important and have their place. But I think it's important as a bee industry that we um, also take a, upon as much of the workload as we can ourselves to, to bring value to our education as well. And, and, and ultimately at the end of the day, beekeepers like myself we need something that that works and something that that helps us out and when i spend money and and as a business i mean it, that's why i'm i'm super skeptical with supplements um because if i'm spending money and then i'm not seeing any results from it well to me i'm i'm not getting anything and so when I, you sent um i reached out to ian and I asked if you'd be willing, because um, at this point you didn't have, I think, anyone selling, so I had to go through you directly. And when I was able to get that product from you, and we were able to test that last year. And the first thing that we did was we tested it not during our honey flows. We didn't test it during our pollen flows. We tested it when there was nothing. And we, we did that you know, so we could see the extreme side of the situation and see if – if it was making meaningful difference. And, and one of the things that you explained to me that it, it, the bioactivator, you know, since it's mimicking pollen, it, it targets jelly production. Do you mind speaking a little bit about the importance of jelly production and, and maybe some things that contribute or, or negatively affect that? Yeah, I think, I think one of the primary markers that we've been missing in our feed formulations has been, uh, adequate levels of proline. Um, proline, there's there's other amino acids that have been uh, overlooked. Uh, there's eight in total when you're talking about uh, pro protein amino acids. And then there's also the non-protein amino, amino acids that we're, we're addressing in that profile as well. But eight amino acids primarily have been missed. Like they're, when you take a, a base uh, pollen supplement patty right now, those eight amino acids aren't completely absent. Uh, because there's complete protein, you know, in those uh, in those patties, they're not completely absent, but they're not in the concentration or the proportions that they're they're found in pollen, and that's really where bioactivator is coming in. The it it, it 
I really couldn't believe what I was looking at when I started to spreadsheet the data out because two of those amino acids uh, in particular, proline and cysteine, are fundamental, like a, a paramount importance for honeybee immunity. Like they, they are the driving molecules uh, that fuel the honeybee immune system, both both sides of their immune system, uh, humoral and cell, cell mediated. Um, and they're, one of those amino acids is the most dominant in floral pollen and floral nectar uh, as well, and that's that's proline. I'll get to the uh, hypopharyngeal gland uh, piece, um, but it, it, it get, like I couldn't believe what I was looking at. The most dominant amino acids in floral nectar and floral pollen were not even really talked about from a nutritional, you know, supplementation perspective. No, I've never heard about it. Yeah, it was, I can't explain it. It, it was hard for me to believe as well, um, but that was the case. Um, anyway, it turns out, so not only does proline feed, feed or fuel one side of the honeybee's uh, immune mechanisms, uh, it's also very important for hypopharyngeal gland uh, development. Queen fecundity, uh, you know, I have a stack of research publications, you know, a couple inches thick on, on proline. It's well so documented. For, so for the new beekeepers that are watching this, the hypopharyngeal gland, what is that responsible for? Well, when you look into your comb and you see that nice shiny substance that the larvae are swimming around in, uh, those glands produce that. Uh, All that brood food and, and, and the royal jelly for the queen as well. And that's, that's a really important gland um, because it drives longevity of the bee, immune, long-term immune system functions. Uh, nothing good happens uh, without that stuff. And yeah, yeah. You, you want those to be fully developed uh, and fully nourished. Like, uh, so getting them developed is it's with nutrition. It's about timing. Like, if if you have and with bees, it's you know that time frame is really condensed. But you know, if you're raising a mammal, it, it can't go through in its growth cycle in, in the first few years of its life. It can't go through periods of uh, malnourishment uh, and be healthy. You know, throughout its adult lifespan. And with honeybees. It's the same thing. It's, it's just the time frame is obviously, you know, condensed down to, you know, 21 days of gestation and then, you know, a couple, a couple of months of life in, uh, in, in the summertime, right? Uh, so it's condensed, but that's our objective in my view as beekeepers with feeding interventions is to make sure that there's no, they don't experience that, that nutritional stress event. I think Randy Oliver explains that out very well in some, some of his writings on his website. Uh, that is paramount. Those nutritional stress events, it, it might, and I'm almost quoting Randy here, but it might take you a month or so to see the results of that stress event, and it might express itself in different ways, uh, but you will pay a price for letting your bees uh, be malnourished. It, 100%. And uh, Randy was one of the people back years ago, I don't know, this is probably a little over a decade, when I really started trying to fine-tune my operation. I'm like, I've got to focus on all the important things and start understanding them better. And so Randy's uh, website, uh, scientificbeekeeping.com, um, was one of the first places I could go. And he, I was hearing some hard questions being asked and some answers also brought about through those questions that Randy was asking about feeding bees and the importance of nutrition. And when I got into beekeeping and uh, I, I was new 21 years ago, a lot of the people in this area, and it's still fairly prevalent, that um, feeding bees is just bad in general. And I would, uh, no one's arguing that the real stuff is best. Nectar is best. Um, pollen is best. Diverse pollens. Not all pollens are e created equal either. And that's another topic as well. But I, I didn't feed very well for the first several years of beekeeping because I didn't understand the importance of it. And I also didn't understand my season. And so anyone in the audience needs to understand that your location is different than Andrew's, who is up in Canada. And I'm here in Tennessee and Florida and all kinds of locations. And so you some people don't have long periods of dearth. There are some people in California and other places in the United States that have dearth periods that can last three months straight with heat wow. and, and stress. And that's where I think the more periods of stress that you have, that is, again, where we need products that are going to be a shield for our bees' immune system. And I can vouch 
you know, from, you know, it's an eyeball test. I don't have, you know, peer reviewed research showing this, but I don't think I need it. I can tell when my bees are doing good and when they're not. And I've got 21 years of a lot of failure and some success uh, to show that when my bees do not lack for nutrition, whether that's naturally or if I've just kept the feed on them and I've done a good job, they are able to withstand higher levels of varroa mites and they are able to withstand um, greater pressures from other maladies. And so I, I urge a lot of people, um, you know, great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition. With that good nutrition being – making sure that your bees never feel that stress. And so you're, you've created a product for both the liquid feeding that we do as a beekeeping – uh, uh, industry and also uh, the pollen patty side of the industry. Now, you were talking about the hypopharyngeal gland and, and proline. What are some other things that you think are important um, that either your biocontrol or your bioactivator bring um, to the honeybees? Let's throw you a hard one. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I think from a, from a compositional perspective, it's about that complete amino acid profile. And I really think that that's what these two products are doing first and foremost as a first, is bringing a complete amino acid profile in, in the right ratios. Biocontrol really, in, in my view, represents something that we needed but didn't exist. That's kind of, kind of why I endeavored to, to make it. But I, I wanted access to a nectar supplement like something that mimicked the nutritional profile of nectar. When we, we look at the honeybees, two nutritive sources, we all know that honeybees have floral pollen and they have floral nectar. But our, our feeding interventions haven't historically haven't taken into account that floral nectar has highly complex chemistry and offers a full complement of amino acids and uh, phytonutrients like bioflavonoids and polyphenols that act like gene switches to upregulate very important you know mechanisms uh, in the honeybees defense systems but there's just a lot there's a lot of stuff going on in, in nectar that's just been completely overlooked we've been feeding you know a sucrose molecule uh, in water so honeybees are resilient they've tolerated it um, but is it optimal uh, was the question that i had and you know i i can say with a degree of confidence that it, it's beneficial to add biocontrol to your uh, to your sucrose syrup feeds. You were touching on something uh, just a minute ago uh, there, Cayman. Um, what the piece that I'm most interested in right now, we're not done from a compositional perspective. Um, there's some things, there'll be some updates to these formulations that are, that are pretty exciting, you know, coming down the pipeline and well, I'll keep you informed there. Um, but the next piece for Apis Biologics, if we're going to have longevity in this space, I want, I can, I can discuss and demonstrate each element in these formulations is backed uh, by either published botany research publications or published entomology research publications. They're not haphazardly formulated. Mm -hmm. They're very well verified, each decision that was made there. But they're brought together for the first time in a nutritional composition. So there's no research on that to total package. Like these products themselves don't have a research team, you know, analyzing what their capabilities are. And that's the next step uh, for me. We're, we're pursuing that right now. Uh, I'm having some in interesting conversations with uh, a couple of PhDs uh, here in New Brunswick that are, it, it was actually quite interesting how this happened. I was at our local AGM uh, and one of them was presenting. And it, uh, it so I'm, I'm probably, I think I'm the only biohacker beekeeper that I've heard talk uh, ad nauseum about the honeybee mitochondria uh, and the electron transport chain and how important that is. And we target that very specifically. Okay. With our um, yeah, Spirit of Toad just said exactly what I'm, I'm thinking right now. Andrew is blowing my mind right now. So, um, you know, Canadians, they're, they're show-offs mostly. It's kind of like Ian, you know, you see his videos and it's like, whoo. Um, before I get into that 
little tidbit. Uh, thanks, Paul, again, so much for supporting us and, and being with us for such a long time. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, An- Andrew is someone I've, I've been wanting to get on here for a long time. I just absolutely love um, beekeepers um, working for uh, themselves. And, you know, and also it's not just that. I mean, A- Andrew and, and other guys like him are, are working with uh, information from universities, and, and it sounds like you're already working with getting some more research on this, but it's exciting to see new products that target and, and try to mimic the real stuff because that's why I've kind of been, you know, raised my eyebrows over the years on some of these supplements that, that come to the market, and, you know, you pay money, and it's like, okay, but what is this exactly trying to do here? I don't know where in nature the bees are necessarily trying to go collect essential oils and bring them back to the colony. Um, not that there can't be some benefits, but when it comes to raising chickens, and I used to raise thousands of them a year, there was we were raising the Cornish rock broilers that grew very quickly. Within eight weeks to nine weeks, we would had a dressed four-and-a-half-pound chicken. So, right. of course, some people tell you, well, those things are – crazy modified actually there was a lot of breeding characteristics that went into creating a chicken that could do that but since a lot of people had issues with those birds mostly a lack of riboflavin and a lack of some other really important uh things that would help the food become available because essentially what you had is instead of a natural more natural chicken where it could take six months to reach full size or more, you had one that was doing in eight weeks to nine weeks. So the nutritional needs were extremely massive in a short period of time. And so if we missed a nutritional step, even for a week to 10 days, that was a massive imprint on the quality and weight gain and survive overall survivability of our chickens. And, and and chickens live longer than bees do, and so it just makes yeah. you makes you wonder. Um, it's, yeah, I, it, that's a very valid point and very condensed time frame. Um, so you, you can't miss days there. You can't certainly can't miss weeks. To your point right. earlier, depending on your depending on your area, some areas are just made for beekeeping, and you know they yes. can flourish with low levels of intervention, but. I certainly don't live in that area. I, I don't either. And, and there are some areas that are just, and it's easier to keep bees in those areas. And the, you know, for those of you who have watched the, the 628 Dirt Rooster channel, he comes to Hive Life every year, Mr. Randy McCaffrey. And you know, he's usually there at the front door greeting you. Guys like him and Mr. Ed live in a really great area for bees because you don't have hard winters and they have long periods of nutrition down there longer than, than most places do. We have a honey flow in a good year that'll give us eight to maybe ten weeks of a significant flow. And then prior to that and after that, there's there's not not a whole lot of weight gains. And sometimes in the fall we will have gains. But there's as many falls that we have little to no gains as there is. Fall is very iffy here because a lot of times we get too dry. So the plants are not healthy, which affects the amino acid profiles of the pollens, the quantity and the quality. And so, you know, so, but, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we, we got to wind this back, wind it back a little bit. And you were talking about some type of electronic exchange, electric exchange, and that's when I went, Psh, and, okay, so what were you talking about there, Andrew? Um, so the space that I operate in outside of beekeeping is uh, there's a, a little subgroup of humans that we like to call ourselves biohackers. Biohackers. <laughs> and in, in that space from a, from a human optimization perspective, uh, it, it's kind of well understood that if it's all about the mitochondria. Uh, so I- inside the cells of eukaryotes. So um, inside the cells of eukaryotes, there's little organelles that, you know, there's some interesting, you know, theories around where they came from, what their or- uh, what their origins are. Like they actually don't carry human DNA. It's it's different genetic code that, that's in them. Uh, so there's some hypotheses out there that they're ancient bacteria. You know, I, you know, depending on what your worldview is, that, that those descriptions either make sense or they don't. 
Um, but there's it, it's interesting anyway, these, these little organelles that we call mitochondria. Within those mitochondria are, there's a complex, a, a series of, of enzymes that are referred to collectively as the electron transport chain. So when an organism consumes food, so you're getting a whole bunch of polyphenols, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, vitamins, minerals, all of those nutrients are coming in, but one of the, one of the primary things that happens to produce energy is that you're getting electrons uh, from that food. And it's an exchange between molecular structures uh, from that food and oxygen uh, in that electron transport chain. So if you want to optimize the energetic output of an, organi of, of an organism, um, there's biohack tweaks that you can do from a nutritional composition perspective to upregulate uh, the efficiency of that electron transport chain, providing support molecules to it. Um, and it turns out it's actually fairly effective in honeybees as well. Wow. So that's, that's fascinating. I know that. So I'm going to, uh, so Etienne Tardif, uh, he's probably going to regret doing this, but he, he invited me to speak at the WAS this year in, in Calgary. And awesome. I'm going to try, I'm going to dig a lot more into that discussion at the, at the WAS. Well, I, I hope that someone records that and, and we can watch that. Um, if, if not, um, I hope nobody might... records it. Oh, no, but I'm, I'm sure you'll do good. You got some time to practice. That's that's later in the year. Um, Etienne Tardif is another uh, friend who I, I really respect a lot of the work that he, the groundwork he's doing for insulation, and and I think that's where beekeepers um, are are really starting to take upon a lot of the um, the work themselves. And you know, we have some needs, and you know, we can let's start seeing if we can figure out some of these questions ourselves, and. And I, I think that's the part, it's at least part of the future. Uh, if, if beekeeping is going to have a strong future, that it has to come from, from that area as well. Unfortunately, there's a lot of instances right now that I know of where um, universities are, are cutting back on their, their honeybee research budgets because, um, you know, certain eco econo the economic issues that are, we're having right now, um, the, the lower totem pole things like beekeeping usually are the, f the first ones in agriculture to take a hit versus something that they look at. Well, the beef industry, the corn industry, these other industries bring, you know, so much more. Yeah. Um, and I, so I, I agree. I, I agree. I think it really is about those public private uh, partnerships. Yes. And I think a, a, a lot of, collaborative stuff between them so wow wow so when a, a bee lands onto a flower from what i understand and this is kind of going a, a different direction but this whole electronic exchange got me going so how part of the re, part of the ways that i understand bees find flowers efficiently that need to be um, foraged is they view there's electronic charges and so a honeybee is, is charged one way. I, I believe that to be a positive, positively charged, and they, they build up that charge with the flapping of their wings. And they're able to detect flowers that have already been visited by other bees since the negative charge, if I am correct, has dropped so low because it's already been visited. But if it has a higher negative charge, then the bee are, bees are able to detect that more readily and it makes it more efficient for them to gather stuff and of course it makes it more efficient in one way is if it's pollen and the pollen's negatively charged and the bees positively charged and and that's where you end up with these fuzzy bees that have all that uh, pollen all over them that everyone posts on facebook and goes oh isn't that cute um, yeah so you know I, i'm certainly aware of the, uh, the the positive charge you know assisting with uh, with pollen collection uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely, but I but I wasn't familiar with the discussion around you know flower to flower uh, visitation. That's uh, that's interesting. I'm not sure if it's fact. It's been hypothesized, I know, um, but it would explain, in my opinion, why bees are so good at what they do. Um, obviously, there's a lot of questions to still ask. Um, so here's a question for you, Dan, and will this affect your product? Am I? Can I add honeybee healthy to biocontrol? 
So in short, I, I, I always try to err on the side of caution when I, when I get questions like that. In short, and the honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know if there's any contraindications there. Um, so honeybee healthy, if I'm, um, so that's lemongrass oil and spearmint oil? I believe, I believe. it has some lecithin in there. Um, I am going to look that up, um, see if I can find that right now. Um, while I'm looking that up, there's a question maybe you can answer, and it's a uh, J.C. Apiary says, um, so I have good incoming pollen. Is it okay or is it bad to still add pollen patties to hives? I'm trying to make hives blow up in population for better honey production. So if you know your area well, I don't know how long you've been keeping bees, but if you're in a good flow right now, uh, and it's a diverse, uh, you know, multi-floral source of pollen coming in. Um, there's probably not going to be a lot more bang for your buck. Um, it depends. If pollen's just kind of trickling in, there's a value proposition there. Um, but if it's coming in heavy and it's coming in from multiple floral sources, you're probably in a pretty good place for uh, for, for pollen. Mm. Uh, well, and to add to that, I would say... Um, this is this is where it's hard as a as a, a new beekeeper that maybe hasn't had enough time or doesn't know anybody who knows more than they do about your floral sources because some pollens by themselves aren't that great um, or 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 perfect as they are they're still helpful but like some pollens by themselves are extremely beneficial to bees just by themselves and are a, a nice complete profile that they can rear brood some po- some pollens can't do that so. Um, if you have a lot of diverse pollens coming in, though, I that's kind of where I stop because if it's the first maple pollen and I know I might not have flyable weather for a week to 10 days after that, I'm going to throw a pollen patty to fill in any nutritional gaps. Even though I don't think maple pollen has a lot of ma- nutritional gaps, it does a great job rearing brood, but I think that it'll help extend that maple out um, to where until the bees can fly again, I can get it. But if your bees are able to fly consistently and get diverse pollens, you're probably just spending money that you can save uh, for a later date. Agreed. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that, Andrew. Um, so I looked at the honeybee, a honeybee healthy uh, ingredients, and I'm looking at it right now. And the ingredients, the first ingredients, uh, is sucrose. The second ingredient is water, uh, spearmint essential oil, lemongrass essential oil, and then lecithin. And so those are the ingredients of uh, uh, Honey Bee Healthy. And this is one of the products, I don't think that it's necessarily probably not harmful for your bees, but I kind of scratch my head because it's expensive to ship a liquid. Your Most of this is just sugar water you know, like what you're already feeding, sucrose is granulated sugar. Um, and so most of what you're paying for is sugar, water, then some essential oils, and then lecithin. So nutri- from a nutritional standpoint, there's really not a whole lot of goodies in there. Yeah, I think, you know, I take a, a pretty conservative and, you know, try to be respectful of the work that, you know, other people that, you know, kind of come before me, you know, and, and have tried to make useful products for beekeepers. I think that there's, when you look across the spectrum of, of products that are available right now, um, you know, there's a lot of different angles kind of being taken on, uh, you know, by the different products that are available. Where we come in is that I, I don't see Apis Biologics as a competitor to any of those products. Um, because there are no formulations like Apis Biologics available. If, if there was, I wouldn't have spent the last, you know, nine, nine plus years trying to formulate these. So from a holistic nutritional perspective, we're, we're kind of, we're, we're on our own in that regard. So depending on what, what effect you're looking for, for me, I'm, I'm, I was always trying to optimize honeybee physiology and you can only optimize honeybee physiology by optimizing honeybee nutrition uh, so you know thera- therapeutic effects from you know different different things I, you know i think that there, there could be a place for that but it's, it's not what i do 
Absolutely. Well, and, and we're not asking you to bash anybody. Different products for different things. And my personal take is that essential oils primarily or are for dealing with, if you're going to use them, um, either the prevention or if you already have the problem, chalk brood and European foul brood, if you're trying to flush that out. I'm not necessarily saying it's going to cure those things, but historically, especially thyme, all that is um, what it's used uh, typically for is, is trying to clean some things out, especially chalk brood and foul brood. It also shows that um, in, in, in recent research done that it's a, it's an antibiotic, and so it kills the good guys with the bad guys, and that's why I'm really hesitant to use some of those products um, when my bees are already healthy, and my goal is to try to boost the healthy bacteria in their guts and not necessarily cut that back. So I um, kind of kind of got off there a little bit on the honey be healthy, but that was a, a good question. I often wonder a little bit about some of these products as well. Um, so that's a, if I, go ahead. Go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I'm not used to doing these videos, Kevin. It's, <laughs> no, it, they're, they're very relaxed and, and we're interested in hearing what you have to say. So um, from a nutritional standpoint, um, there was a question up above. Do multiple pollen sources actually say anything about nutrition, or is it more about volume? So, yes to both. Uh, it has to be coming in an adequate quant quantity, uh, but most certainly uh, multifloral sources are required. Um, came, came and kind of touched on this um, a few minutes ago, but there are a number of pollens that don't meet the full uh, nutritional requirements of the honeybee. Uh, they provide beneficial things, uh, but from an amino acid, a fatty acid, phytosterol, sterol uh, perspective, uh, there's there's elements missing. Most most notably, like the like I guess the missing elements that we know the most about are amino acid ratios, deficiencies in amino acids in, in some pollens. It's what we we understand the most. Mm -hmm. So yeah, monofloral sources can be problematic. My biggest question, but if I had to pick between the two of your products, um, myself personally, I'm pretty familiar. What are the goals, you know, behind, you know, pollen patties? And that is to, you know, try to build bees up, you know, because you have to have those fats, you have to have the proteins, you have to have those minerals to build and make more bees. But you, ta you touched on this earlier. But when it comes to the sugar syrup, a lot of us has just been feeding straight sucrose, which would be your you know white table sugar um, at the store, or you know some of us have been f maybe feeding a mix like Pro Sweet from Man Lake, or maybe even straight high fructose corn syrup with a little bit of water added. I've never um, used that myself, but you know so you're taking it a step further and saying that these are this is kind of empty to a degree. Um, is there any negative? impacts to our bees of serving up that much bulk that's empty not having some of maybe the important details that's my biggest question with your two products is you know the nectar um you, you said it has amino acids and stuff in it I've, I've kind of been told that sugar syrup is kind of close to nectar it's the closest thing we have but it sounds like we might be a little off base here yeah, I think the uh, the ratios that we're the ratios that we're chasing are, you know, we're we're getting to better understand what those optimal you know sucrose to water ratios are, and but from a nutritional perspective, uh, one thing that I an area around that uh, thread came in where I think that we we need more research, more needs to be understood. We'll we'll use a, a, the mammalian you know a context again as, as an analogy. But when you consume carbohydrate uh, and a mammal consumes car carbohydrate, you need, like primarily the B vitamins uh, are used, like the more carbohydrate a mammal consumes, uh, the more the demand is uh, on nutrition to, to process those carbohydrates. Um, so is there parallel mechanisms inside arthropods? Um, you know, there's some, there's all kinds of room for more research. Um, but again, in the absence of wanting to wait uh, that amount of time for those mechanistic publications to happen, um, I think a much more sensible approach is to say, what are the nutrient profiles of floral nectar on average, taking mean concentrations across hundreds of samples, and let's provide that 
and then we can wait for the mechanistic research publications to, uh, to come out because it's it's not there you know randomly. Uh, there's there's a you know a, a physiological co-adaptation to that those nutritional profiles, right? I totally agree with that. Um, yeah, we're we're just trying to play catch up with the the game that nature's already playing, and and understand what's going on and and so you basically you've just you've just studied hundreds of types of nectars if i understood you correctly and you're evaluating you know what are these different ratios that are in there and obviously and i'm sure you've seen this just like i have there's there's always a few colonies that come out of winter there's some that just come out and just like bam they're already good but there's a few of them that's like eh what's going on here they just can't seem to get it going and getting the getting a little bit of clean nectar and some clean pollen just brightens the ship and then they just take off whether there was a pathogen in there or something i i, I don't know but um obviously that real stuff there's something magical in there that that's making it work there, there is and, and that's absolutely what we're chasing that is the pursuit like what is that you know factor factor x you know i i'm starting to you know come to the the realization that i, I don't think factor x you know, per se is, you know, I, I don't think that we're, we're going to find a smoking gun, you know, per se. I think what, what it's going to, going to be is it's going to be we're, we're going to get more precise and more serious about mimic, mimicking the complexities that are in those, again, you know, pollen over 250, you know, biologically significant molecules are in that. When, you know, pollen sub supplements historically have had, you know, 40 or 50 elements, you know, be, being provided. So I, I think it's just about respecting the minutia to, to your point, you know, we're our, we would be well served to respect and mimic nature. Mm -hmm. Well, GM Doolittle, one of my favorite um, beekeeping authors of old, um, who is considered the father of modern queen rearing, for those of you who don't know, um, his books are written in an old fashioned style, but I, I really enjoy them quite a bit. And he goes through the process of how he started grafting queens and brought that about. Um, he said, you know, beekeepers, if they want to bring value to their business, because he was running a beekeeping business, you can only mimic nature. If you defy nature, it's gonna it's gonna cost you. And and so that's what you're building is something that really isn't. Um, you haven't come up with some new type of thing where you've taken some pond sludge and like, you know, this has some stuff for bees. Let's mix it in the sugar syrup and, and see what we got here. You've just taken what's already available that the bees are bringing in and going, how can we mimic this as best as possible? What, I, what I've done over the last nine, nine years or so came in here, it, it surprises me to no end that it hadn't been done before me. Like it, it, it honestly blew my mind when I started to dig into this is like, how are we, the beekeeping industry has been around for so long. Like, how has this not already been done? Um, we were just waiting for you to come around. <laughs> apparently. I, apparently so, you know, look, I, I, I didn't think it would be, yeah, it, it is what it is, I guess. Well, asking the hard questions. So here's yeah. another hard question. Um, Andrew, is there a low dosage to a high dosage range of APIS biologics or bioactivator? Uh, perhaps if the bees don't need much feed, but you want to get a good dose in them, or do you just recommend the standard dose? So let's say that you're a beekeeper on a budget. Kind of how would you target this to optimize it while thinking of budgetary concerns? Yeah, so certainly only feed when it's indicated, uh, for for sure. Um, but if you're, you know, coming up on a on a dearth period, you know, and feeding sucrose is indicated, the the dosage range that's recommended on the package at 102.5 milligrams per liter is the representation of multiple nectar sources. Like, like that's how it spreadsheets out. When you when you look at the data, those are the numbers. So if you have a multi-floral source of nectar coming in, not not right down to the microgram, but it's going to be very, very close, that amount of those nutrients uh, coming in in that, in that scenario. So to take that up a little bit higher, uh, if I'm understanding your uh, question correctly, so that to me, that's the minimum dosage range. Uh, only use it when it's indicated. 
Um, you know, say the ruin is needed, but if, if a feeding intervention is needed, 102.5 milligrams per liter. If you have a condensed feeding window and you want to put more nutrition into them faster, um, they're stay tuned on that. I, I think you you might see an update uh, on our packaging coming coming your way. Interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Now, we only used um, besides for our for raising queens, we only used your bioactivator in the global patties that we had at the conference for two weeks. We had a fantastic early flow where the bees were able to just get out and they were able to get hen bit and dead nettle pollens and dandelion pollens and maple. So I only fed for two weeks because you can't beat nature at its own game. And so, Mm -hmm. and, and besides it's a heck of a lot cheaper just to let the bees go out and get it. Um, Mm -hmm. But, uh, what, no matter what you're doing, whether you're feeding a pollen patty or whether you're feeding sugar syrup, um, it take, even just the labor of getting that out in the field is is quite expensive. And you know, Laurel, my wife says, um, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and uh, no, she's great. So as far as that goes, that's that's how much I fed of Bio Activator this year is just two weeks. So two pounds of pollen patties in a bad year, I might feed four to five pounds per colony to build them up with the natural pollens but where i plan on putting my money into my operation is july mid-july august and into september but especially august and september because that's when mites typically if you're going to have high mite loads in my area that's when they're starting to make their impacts now we should have already treated them and kept the mites low so we're doing that but whenever we treat the bees and i don't care what product you're using if you're using formic acid you're using thiamol you use apivar you use any of those products, that there are some negative effects that happen to the colony. It's it's a period of stress. Any of those treatments stress the colonies out. And so I I really think that after a treatment period, that would be a time to bring in the big guns on nutrition and try to make the you know give the bees some nutrition that's going to help support their immune system and build them up for that fall flow. So for me. The most critical time of the year that I plan to use it is going out of out of the hard parts of summer and build up for fall for that winter cluster. I, th- I think that's the most crucial for my location. Yeah, I, I think that's really sound advice on the on the timing of the, the feeding intervention thing. When when you look, one of the primary reasons why we treat for mites is because they vector viruses into the honeybee colony that will collapse. Uh, the colony so immune status of the colony uh you know so at at the end of the day when you're when you're killing mites the ideal output of that you know dropping that mite load uh, down is that you're going to have reduced viral titers uh, inside that colony as an end result Um, so it makes sense to me um, the timing of a nutritional intervention at that time to give honeybees the raw material that they need to upregulate their immune defense mechanisms so they can better combat viruses. That, that's kind of my whole proposition here with these uh, nutritional profiles. I need to engage some third parties uh, to, you know, kind of pursue that and, and get, get some more answers. But that's how I think about nutrition, uh, nutritional timing around mite treatments is exactly how you described for those reasons. Yeah, I just, I just think that, um, the, this is a product that is supposed to help our bees through periods of stress and to smooth out that stress as much as possible. And our bees do go through stress. I think um, for many of us, if we don't understand this, if you're a new beekeeper and kind of don't understand how this works, one of the benefits of honeybees is the fact that they overwinter as a cluster. And there could be 10, 15, 20,000 bees, depending on the size of the cluster, that overwinters and they're going to be able to build up and be quite strong. Well, their competition and sometimes they're straight enemies, um, like yellow jackets and European hornets, or if you're in a different country and you have different types of hornets, they start off with one queen. And there's a lot of other creatures like robber flies in our area and assassin bugs, and they start off small early in the season, but they build up throughout the spring and summer, and they crescendo right 
at the end of the season. They have high populations. And so that is why late summer, it's not just the varroa mites and other pressures inside the colony. Um, there's outside pressures that grow as well. And, and so having any tool that we can have to give our bees a stronger immune system is, is to me, is money in the bank. Now, um, we have a question down here. Where can I get this and learn more about when to use it? So, Andrew, I have go- gone ahead and gone to your website, and there on your website is a find a distributor, a, a distributor, and I'm going to post that down into the comments to where um, folks can read that. Yep. Yep. And, uh, the store store locator uh, tab uh, as well. Um, so it's just Apis Biologics, but um, I'm going to send this over to Chris because Chris is the <laughs> wizard behind the camera that makes all this happen. I want to say thanks, Chris. Um, so getting back on to that whole biocontrol and, and nectar being so um, crazy awesome, um, and you're trying to mimic that, what, what do you think about glucose oxidase and, and nectar on how that relationship affects um, as nectar's ripening, creating hydrogen peroxide. Do you think that your supplement could positively impact that as well? So I don't know is the short answer there, Cam, but that's a very interesting thread. Um, so hydrogen peroxide, I suspect that uh, the hydrogen peroxide story is one of the reasons. It's certainly one of the mechanisms uh, that produce that um, antimicrobial effect that we see uh, from from a nectar flow. So those colonies that are you know experiencing digestive problems, you know microsporidium, you know there's we've we've all seen that those weak hives and you squash their bee guts, you know they're full of spores, you know millions of spore count per bee. A nectar flow comes on, all of a sudden magically nozema disappears. Um, you know so it's I, I definitely think it's an important part of the story. Uh, to what degree the nutritional composition of nectar is is interacting with those uh, chemical reactions, I don't know. Uh, I haven't been able to find any. Uh, there's no smoking guns to point to there, but that story is evolving. There's some really smart people working on that uh, hydrogen peroxide piece for sure. Well, I, I was just curious. Um, you know, there's just so many components of this. I, I love this whole discussion, um, asking the hard questions and, and and trying to find some answers. And so Chris Madera's posted down below into the comments, and he just put it up on the page, apisbiologics.com slash store locator. You can go to that, and you can see where you can get um, these products. And and if nothing crazy changes, I, I suspect that, Andrew, you're going to come back to Hive Life this next year or at least have somebody there with your product. Um, of course, we'd like to have as many Canadians as will come on down. I know we're we, – we, our po- parties are probably a little too warm for you. You like it cold. Um, I certainly will be coming back. As long as the invitation's there, that's a, that's a party that I don't plan on missing. That was a, that was a lot of fun last year. Well, thank you. We, you know, you'll, you'll ha- always have an in- invitation as long as you're trying to keep helping beekeepers and, and like you are right now and, and asking some hard questions. And, and that just excites me um, a lot. Hive Life was kind of similar to what you said earlier. Is we were kind of surprised that there wasn't folks already running something like that because there, there was a need and, and, you know, there's there's people out there that are smarter than I am. I mean, my wife will tell you that, um, and, and so will my mother. <laughs> uh, however, uh, your mother's a really nice lady. I had an opportunity to meet your mom at the conference. She's a, she's a really nice woman. Well, she she is. Um, if it wasn't for her, I'd probably be in a prison somewhere. I'd say, um, it's old saying, "Beat the devil out of me," and you know. Anyhow, uh, I have a great mother, and uh, this was. Let's let's get back just a little bit more into the product, and as we mix and add these things, I I think the most exciting thing, especially for those who are watching that do not live in the U.S. or Canada, that you don't have access to the 
expensive subs. There, there's like a recipe on Randy Oliver's website, scientificbeekeeping.com, where you can take things like um, eggs or dried eggs and brewer's yeast and various different things. Yeah, Don Bearden says, Cayman, we all know Laurel is running the show. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'm not going to argue at all. I know it's good for me. Um, but as far as uh, that goes, um, one of the biggest questions I get whenever I post a video on how to mix up pollen sub, and for those of you who don't know, if if you're trying to save money, instead of buying pre-made patties, and the problem with buying pre-made patties is if you purchase – at Andrew's um, bioactivator, once you have the patty, you can't mix it in there. Um, you, you can't sprinkle it on or anything, Andrew. I don't think it works like that. No. no. no, no. You're telling me it's, it's not, not like Parmesan or anything like that where I can just... No, sir. No. Okay, no, sir. <laughs> I, I, I thought so. So for those of you who don't have access to that, this um, there are recipes online where you can custom make your own and, and this is something that I think would be great to add in addition um, and maybe reach out to Andrew and see if he can give you little tips on formulation or something for something so custom for the protein. I know you're busy, Andrew, but, you know, a little yeah, bit more works good for you. Yeah, I like getting uh, emails from, from customers for sure. I, I like helping out where I can there. It, it, my response time's not great, um, but but I, I do get to those emails. Well, excellent. And you know, f that could fill in some important nutritional gaps that they don't have. And let me get to this real quick. Brian J. Matter, thank you so much. And sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, we appreciate you very much. Spirulina mixed with sugar water. Does it have any benefits? Spirulina is a protein. Greetings from Wisconsin. Andrew, do you want to take that one? I know no, you I, think you, I, I think I want you to take that one. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't be like that. I don't think in sugar water it would probably have a ton of benefits. Um, I have heard of benefits in in patties, but th there's limited research that I've seen on that, and most of that, um, I those were the ones that I have used, I was not impressed with. But I'm not sure if I wasn't impressed with them at all. However, there was so much essential oils mixed with them, it could have been the essential oils causing the problems, and the spirulina it could have been just fine. Um, I probably would, when in doubt, I don't do it. Um, that's kind of the way I, I, I go with those kind of things. All you, Andrew, your take, <laughs> hot take. Yeah, you know, look, I'm I'm really not familiar enough with uh, with with spirulina. My my whole method is about analyzing the nutritional composition, of pollen and nectar. Anything that falls outside of that, uh, I'm not the right guy to to ask those questions to. That is a great answer. Um, there's a question by J.K. Photography um, asking if it's available in the U.K. Um, is it okay to import, and what is the shelf life? So shelf life in the sealed packaging before you open it is two years, kept in cool, dry, dry, dry is the important word on the, the package. So these, these nutrients are very hygroscopic. They, they love the wick moisture. Uh, there's a dry card in the package. But as soon as you open that package, consider it a food item uh, and use it up you know, as, as soon as possible. Definitely reseal the package you know, tightly, right? Uh, but you use it up as, as soon as you can. If you are going to store it, like if you end up in the fall with some, you know, le left over, maybe double seal it, you know, put it inside a Ziploc bag uh, because they're very hygroscopic uh, nutrients. Uh, proline in particular is one of the most uh, hy hygroscopic uh, nutrients in, in the profile. So it's uh, two years in the sealed uh, packaging, like factory sealed packaging, if it's kept in a dry environment. So if you live in a very humid area, that could, you know, d decrease, right? Um, to a two-year sealed, sealed dry environment, as far as the UK regulatory environment, um, I have had some people reach out from the UK. The last I heard, uh, the gentleman had reached out to, I forget the name of the agency there, kind of ran our, you know, our, the information package that I gave, gave him. And I think he said we were okay. So the, the challenge with that is that, you know, from a Canadian regulatory perspective is that, uh, the obligation is on uh, me as the exporter to understand 
the uh, the importing countries regulations before I do that. So we could we could look into that, but it, it's definitely something like the United States and Canada have such uh, amalgamated like the way we trade. Um, so the relationship between Health Canada and the FDA is very well mapped out and, and understood. I would I would just have to proceed cautiously there, but it's definitely something I'd be interested in learning more about. So, Andrew, another question that I almost forgot to get to is on the packet, you know, it says biocontrol is the first and only formulation of phytochemical phenolic amino acid vitamin and phytohormone profiles naturally present and that are naturally present in floral nectar and that have been independently research verified to produce beneficial effects at the population, county, and individual levels of analysis. Do you maybe, is there some things that you can share with us a little bit? I personally don't know a whole lot about any of those things, phytochemical, phenolic acids, vitamins, phyto, phytohormone profiles. You know, those are all big, you know, $10 words. And I'm from Gainesboro. So, I mean, <laughs> is there anything you can help us out with there? Yeah. So again, floral nectar has a very, very complex chemistry. And you were kind of alluding to that, you know, a little bit a few minutes ago, came in with the discussion about glucose oxidase and the production of, you know, hydrogen peroxide, you know, from a, I guess the, the chemistry side of nectar, we're just starting to, you know, get a grasp on, you know, some of those, uh, some of those mechanisms and why, why the chemistry is important. So pH is important in the chemistry and then the glucose oxidase hydrogen peroxide thing is obviously very important. So there's the chemical side of nectar, which we're starting to better understand. And then there's the nutritive, uh, you know, profiles of nectar, which I'm trying to take on. And then there's the phytochemical, uh, you know, profiles that I'm also trying to take on uh, with these uh, with these products. And the phytochemicals more or less are acting not so much as nutrients in the way that a vitamin acts as a nutrient or in the way that, you know, an amino acid or a fatty acid acts as a nutritional, you know, molecule. They're more acting at, uh, at an epigenetic level. Uh, so in... In, I'll go back to using humans as an analogy. When we consume plant polyphenols and plant bioflavonoids and remnants of, you know, this whole pharmacopoeia of phytochemicals that are in plants, when we consume those, most of those act on our body as a, a mild stressor in some manner or another. And the, and the concept is referred to as hormesis or, or hormetic effect where that minor stress event on that physiological mechanism will produce uh, an upregulation or an expression of genetic pathways that lead to the output is a more resilient organism as, as, as an end result. And, it, and that's not unique to humans or basically anything that consumes plants is exposed to the, the phytochemical uh, pharmacopoeia that nature offers and they basically run up and down the genetic code of the, the organisms that consume them and fire on genes as they're doing that dance basically is a, is a way of saying it right so it, it's like adding a, a some octane boost to your your truck or something like that it's, it's giving you the good stuff that to, to fire really good um, yeah so there's there's, there's a there's a genetic code, obviously, for every organism, and within that within that genetic code, there's potential for uh, there's there's a lot of potential for optimal expression, and there's a lot of potential for negative expression. Uh, so, to get a fully optimized genetic expression, you need a fully optimized nutritional profile. So, honeybees have honeybees have evolved with the evolved or were designed uh, in my, my particular worldview. Um, but that design has very intricate elements that are a part of it that act on that code to make it express itself in an optimal way. And in the absence of those, what you have is a suboptimal expression of that genetic code, which means a more susceptible organism to parasites, pathogens, xenobiotic stressors like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. If you, if you want a resilient honeybee, it has to be exposed to those uh, hormetic stressors from nature. So that, that those those $10 words that I'm referring to on the back of the package are those hormetic stressors. 
Wow. So this is why Ian Stepler calls you the crazy New Brunswick beekeeper. Um, what do you mean? Does he say that? He does, you've never heard him say that before? Uh, yeah, he, he refers to you that way all the time, man. He's like, that. yeah, I love Andrew's stuff. He's that crazy New Brunswick beekeeper is always up to something. I can't believe he would say that about me. Oh, I can believe it. You know, uh, I can believe a lot of stuff from Ian. Um, but uh, I want to say a big thanks to JK all the way from the UK. Um, uh, we really appreciate your donation, sir, and, and for more importantly coming on and, and spending this time with us. Just some great questions keyed up. Um, uh, sun, the Sun Bunny says, can you store in the fridge? What do you think about that, Andrew? Yeah, so most things store better in the fridge. So my my shelf stability testing, the lab that we work with for that uh, that you know fridge storage cooler temperatures. Uh, I can't do a lot of jokes. <laughs> uh, too funny. I was I, I didn't know I was coming on live with Cam, and he, he surprised me with that one. Sorry. Yeah. Well, there was miscommunication on my end. And I got this one confused with another one that was supposed to go live. This was gonna, this was supposed to be pre-recorded, and I remember that now. So I appreciate you still going through with it, Andrew. I think everyone's uh, really enjoyed this, and we still have some great questions. Um, so the refrigerator could possibly be better, but your research lab um, or the researchers yeah. there, um, it says it, it's got two good years in the, the right conditions. That's it. Just dry is what you got to remember with these nutrient profiles. So we don't add any preservatives. There's no chemical stabilizers. Like I don't think that there's a value proposition for chemical stabilizers in, in honeybee nutrition. So we, we've kind of foregone the extra stability that you get from adding those chemicals. Um, and we're, you know, taking a precautionary approach to, you know, shelf life and, and stability. So just remember to keep it as dry as you can. Uh, and then once you open it, you know, use it in a, in a reasonable time frame. Time frame. That's a dry, shame. dry, dry. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, you get that, that bread from the store that's got all those fertilizers in it, like ammonium sulfate and mono ammonium phosphate and all those things in that bread to keep it from, you know, developing bacteria yeah. and fungi that are going to get on that bread. You, but, you know, it kind of tastes a lot, little lifeless. There's just not a lot to it, but it'll sit on that shelf and look good for a while. But when my mom makes homemade bread, and that's my mom actually makes quite a bit of that stuff to sell and things, um, it doesn't last near as long. But boy, it is good. It is real good. Um, you know, so fresh, fresh is say. better. That, that's what I would say about biocontrol and bioactivator. They don't last long, but boy, are they good. Boy, are they good. <laughs> that, that needs to be on the back. Um, so Global Patties in Canada. They did make patties for Ian Stepler with Andrew's product might be available to the public. Have I heard that correctly, Andrew, that Global is working with you guys now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you go to Global's website, uh, both the U.S. Montana uh, factory uh, and, the, and the Canadian factory in Airdrie, Alberta, uh, have us as an offering on their website. So if you look at the options, uh, you'll see Apis Biologics as one of the options that you can get added in the patties. Really great folks at Global. Um, really appreciate the uh, the initiative came in to get the uh, discussion going with the with the conference. And I think you're you're a logistical wizard. I, I can't believe that you you pulled that off on on short notice. But uh, but that really got you know the conversations going between uh, Mike at Global and I. And uh, yeah, no, it's it, it's a good good relationship. Great people there. Well, well, thanks for saying that, but we're we're just super excited. I'm a I'm a beekeeper first and foremost. We might run a conference, and we might have a YouTube channel, but um, I absolutely love being in the bees. Right before I I, I came in here and did this with you, um, I was out there in some beehives pulling queen cells, and and just getting into some hives that were making a little bit of honey. We're just starting to get the honey production going good here, and and I just love that. I absolutely love that. And so, you know, whenever we can partner with, you know, companies like Global or yourself or, or anybody that can bring value to beekeepers, that is what we are all about. And I'm just thrilled to and blessed to be here, you know, getting to listen to all this and learn things that I don't know. Um, it's wonderful to have this access. So uh, Jay Hook Fishing says, should the flaxseed oil for pollen sub be organic? What do you think about that, Andrew? 
So I think with organic, you know, versus conventional, there's, uh, it's, it's kind of like politics, you know, it, 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 it's a very kind of, kind of polarized, you know, discussion topic. And I don't know that I want to take that one on, uh, but I, I would say to each their own in that regard. Um, yeah. So, um, so JK asks, is this a similar product as Hive Alive? And uh, so f- first of all, I think I'm going to answer that. I know Andrew doesn't like to, uh, to talk about other products a whole lot. Um, I, I, I can, I can take that one. I, all right, I appreciate, all right. you. I appreciate you throwing me a lifeline. And, yeah. I appreciate that lifeline, but, but, but I will take that. Um, they, I think it's kind of an apples to oranges, uh, you know, d- discussion point. So, Hive Alive, I'm not familiar with their formulation. Like, like from a cursory level, like I, I kind of get the, the basic premise, um, but they're targeting kind of like like ther- therapeutic effects is kind of the, the 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 proposition with 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 Hive Alive. And you know, I know that they have some research publications behind that, and I, I think that, that it's it's credible. But I don't think they're in the same like category it's not the same thing like what we're trying to do is complete the nutritional profile uh, for honeybees uh, mimicking nectar and pollen uh, and then there's uh, hive alive you know pr- produces a, a therapeutic effect with some specific molecules so it's not really an apples to apples uh, discussion i would totally agree different. with that um i don't think that they're trying to do the same thing you're doing i don't think you're trying to do the same thing that they're doing honestly um uh, I, personally, I've got some of that um, Hive Alive um, product, and I view that honestly uh, for I use it for two things. So when we we make sugar syrup up, most of the time we're filling up at least two hundred and something gallons when we're going through our operation and feeding. And sometimes we get out there and we're like, oh, we don't need quite as much as we thought. We made too much. And you know, I don't like it when that happens, but it could be twenty gallons left over. Sometimes as much as fifty gallons left over, and I can get some fermentation issues and the thymol that is in Hive Alive does a really good job preserving that for me. Um, and thymol has some benefits to the colony um, at times. And if I'm going to use something as a preservative, that's my personal, uh, that's what I prefer to use is something like thymol as opposed to bleach or something like that that um, can be used. And that was a a question that was, uh, around here somewhere, um, someone was asking um, Andrew, you know, if you have excess syrup and you've got your product in there and you're trying to preserve it, you know, outside of probably refrigeration or something like that, what would be the best way to try to save that for a week or so until you're ready to use it again? So if you've mixed bio biocontrol into some sucrose syrup and you've got some extra left over? Yes. Uh, keep it as cool as you can. Do you think Keep it is cool. they would try to try, to try to avoid, try to avoid that number one? Yes, try to avoid that number one. But let's say you made five gallons and you got a gallon left over. You know, you and you put it in a jug, and you sticking in the fridge will prolong the life of that quite a bit. I've done that in the past, and it does great. Would it hurt the product, or do you know to freeze it? That's that's interesting. Is would it hurt to freeze it? Yeah, so I, there's a lot of different compounds in that profile, and so some of those compounds there is there is a food data on them. Uh, some of them can be frozen thawed, uh, but anytime you superheat something, you'll damage the molecular structure, and molecular structures also get damaged in a freeze thaw cycle as well. So I don't have any hard evidence to say yes or no to that question, but I would advise, uh, I think there's a, a cautionary tale there. Just you, you don't want to spend the money on a package of this stuff and then damage the molecules in, in a freeze thaw cycle. And I just want to say again to everybody real quick, if you're curious about trying to save money on pollen pay, so one of the things that's kind of expensive, and I, and I interrupted myself, I'm bad about that, I apologize. But when it comes to trying to save money on pollen patties and also mixing bioactivators, so this is kind of what I would suggest. First of all, I'm going to be a little self-serving. We have videos on our playlists um, where you can go and see a couple different recipes, and most of them are based off of 
uh, Man Lakes uh, Ultra B Pollen Patties because you can get the dry powder. A lot of times you can wait around for a sale or something like that, and you can get 10% off or maybe more, especially around um, big holiday seasons like you know Black Friday, various things like that. And you can buy the powder, or you can. Buy, there's other companies that do that as well. Mega B, Dayton Scott, uh, their their product. So you can get these bases, and you can save some money making it yourself. And I've got recipes on there for if you have access to syrup, how to make pollen patties using a syrup for the sweetener. I have ones where if you only have access to granulated sugar, and Andrew was talking about using flax oil as the preferred oil um, to help keep them from drying out. And so I was using canola oil or vegetable oil in my video. But now we understand the flaxseed oil provides more nutritional benefits while still keeping it um, from drying out as much. And that's where... I would say if you're wanting to use this bioactivator product, instead of buying the patties outright and pre-made, take a little bit more time, mix it yourself, and if you follow some of the recipes that I have, you'll you'll save money and it'll more than the savings pay for you know what this will cost you. Which um, for our operation, we we have to weigh these things. We sometimes we're feeding several hundred colonies at a time. And it, it, it's not cheap to feed bees at any, any moment, but we find it valuable to feed these products because we see gains and, and we also see um, um, immune system uh, benefits as well. So Ian Stepler just said bees love the coconut oil as well. Indeed they do, sir. Indeed they do. 76 coconut oil or 91 coconut oil? Does that depend on how many coconuts they use to make the oil, or what does that mean? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it, 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 it's a processing standard. So would, would the 91, Andrew, be a higher quality yeah. one, or would it actually be the 76? Uh, I would have to refresh myself on those. I'm familiar with those numbers. Uh, but I wouldn't want to give a response to that off the cuff. I'd have to look at them. Basically, what you're looking for is uh, unrefined, unbleached uh, coconut oil. Uh, I, that's the melting point is what Flower Street Farm B says. Interesting. Uh, you know, I just, I'm just i learning all the time. I've had people come and say, Cayman, we really appreciate you teaching us all this stuff, but I'm right here learning as much as anybody. Um, the place... I don't know if it's appropriate to mention, you know, sources, uh, but in for, for the U.S. listeners, where I used to get uh, some of these more uh, difficult oils to source, coconut oil, I was getting it from a place, uh, Jedwards International, I believe. Jedwards. Jedwards, Jedwards yeah, International. So it's a US, U.S.-based company. So we're talking about uh, lecithin. Uh, they're a good supplier for lecithin as well. Hey, Chris, do you think you might be able to see if you can pull that up for us? Um, do you know how that's spelled? Is it like J-E-D or is it G-E-D? Uh, J-E-D. J-E-D, okay. So, um, hmm. Yeah, it's a little it's a little, little pricey up in Canada to, uh, because the freight, right? The freight. It's yes. It's brutal here to get anything shipped in. Very interesting. So um, mixing all of this stuff up. We want to keep it fresh. It makes total sense to me because the goal with this is to create a, a healthy immune system. And part of the, one of the most important parts of the immune system, as I understand it, and Andrew can correct me if I'm wrong, is is the microbiome of the bee. Um, you've got to have a healthy gut to be able to absorb these things. And so I think that's yeah. maybe one of my biggest concerns I would have with having those preservatives in these products to maybe extend the shelf life to four or five years is could there be negative consequences for having that? Yeah, most of the time what we end up discovering is that the chemicals that we, you know, kind of use ubiquitously in, in food, you know, manufacturing and processing um, – Typically, we, we end up finding, <clears throat> finding out later on down the road that, oh, 
you know, it turns out that those were actually very problematic and we probably shouldn't have those, uh, you know, in, in food, right? So for me, I just take a very precautionary approach to the chemical uh, stabilizers and preservatives in these products, fundamentally because we just don't know. There's a lot of <clears throat> stabilizers and preservatives that are approved for use in, in animal nutrition. And I certainly have lots of options that I could make this stuff never go bad. Uh, but, but that's, yeah, I just don't think there's a value proposition there. So Chris found the link for uh, Jed Words um, to their bulk natural oils. Um, do you mind posting that, Chris, down in the comments below so folks can can look at that and see if that's something that would be good for their um, operation? Um, thanks for providing that, Andrew. We, you know, we try to you know just have all the stuff and then let people choose. You know, some people are going to watch this and go, you know, that guy Andrew Munn is a quack. Um, and you know, they're, they're going to do something different and, and there's going to be some people go, wow, that stuff's really good. Uh, thanks for posting that. So that there folks is a place where you can get some natural yeah. oils for your pollen patties. Um, and maybe for other things that you may need for agriculture or whatever. Um, so Andrew, what, what's something that if, if you had someone come up and ask you, um, you know, why, what, what is the most important thing that this is going to do for my operation? I run a business, maybe I run a thousand hives or a hundred, doesn't really matter. But you know, this, this is going to, to be a cost. What, what would you say to that person in regards to what this is designed to help? So for the people that have come on later can understand. Yeah, sure. There, there's a bit to unpack there, but I think the the pursuit, uh, I guess the the intention behind Apis Biologics, is to produce a more resilient honeybee. And you know, I think we're we're very much used to thinking about feeding interventions and putting metrics around that relative to to brood production. Like that, that's kind of the common you know thought thought process when we put patties on and we feed in the spring, obviously we want to make more bees. And that's that's a very important metric because that, that's what that's what drives the economy uh, in, in those business models, whether you're building up for, for honey production or you're building up to sell nukes, whatever your management system is about, you need bees uh, to make that management system work. So it's an important metric. But, but what we're bringing to the table is a proposition that there should be an additional set of metrics. Does that feeding intervention, does that nutritional program that you're employing produce a healthier, more resilient organism? And if it does, then what you should see over time is not just a spike or an increase in brood production over that predetermined period of time. What you should see is more consistency in your operation, season, season to season, less overwinter losses, less two, three frame colonies coming out of winter, just more consistency in your operation. You're never going to take all of the, the swings out of beekeeping. It, it's beekeeping, right? There's going to be good years and there's going to be bad years. Um, but the idea of a comprehensive nutritional program is to provide those raw material inputs to give it, to, to inject a sense of resilience in, in that organization or that, that operation. That's, you know, it's in the, the needs between professional beekeepers and hobby beekeepers are, are quite different. The professional beekeepers looking more at the dollar signs, like, like you said, I need to produce more bees for pollination or I need to produce more bees for uh, selling packages or nukes or whatever. And so I need to be able to get more bees quicker. Obviously, better nutrition is going to help with that. And then I think for a lot of the smaller beekeepers, um, you know, their, their goal, and, and, and I see a lot of folks who buy um, various products um, from different suppliers, and the goal behind them and the reason they buy them is because they really think that it is really beneficial to bees, and they, they just want to help their bees wherever they can, and I got a lot of respect for that uh, sentiment. One of the things that I would argue, and, and, and call me biased, but I have yet to see a product that targets what your product does, where you are specifically, your only goals are to study pollen with your bioactivator, and then with your biocontrol, you're studying nectar, and you're just going, look, nature's got this figured out. It's obviously doing a pretty good job. 
can we create something that mimics that as best as we humanly possibly can? And a lot of the other products that I would argue that are on the shelf today, um, when they designed those products, that was not what they were going for. It's not that they don't have any use um, or that they're no good, but I I would argue that this is the only product that truly um, targets pollen and targets nectar and tries to copy that. And so um, that that would be kind of my argument um, with this product to someone. And that's when, when people do ask me about that, that's what I tell them is this is the best mimicking product I've seen yet uh, of, of the, the real goodies. Um, we, we are trying to move the needle there, Cayman. I, I think that's a pretty fair assessment. Um, I, I do think that we, we occupy a unique space uh, right now. But one thing that I, I will say is that what I, what I hope to do, whether or not we're around in 10 years uh, or not, there's a lot of free market dynamics that will dictate that. But what I'm hoping we can do through bringing these comprehensive formulations to the table is move the needle. Uh, because now the discussion is real about the composition of floral nectar and floral pollen. Uh, and, yeah, we want to move the needle. And whether we move that needle a little bit uh, and then another company picks it up and, and takes it the rest of the way, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of dynamics there. But I will say that we are going to move the needle, sir. Exactly. So I've just, we're going to take just a couple more questions and then we're going to wind it on down. Andrew, I really appreciate you spending this time. If you don't mind just sticking with us for a couple more seconds. And if anyone has any important questions, start um, start hitting us with them and we'll try to get to several of them. Um, this question um, kind of goes into the, the last one that we, we did prior. So the best thing... Um, th- this one was preserving it afterwards with sugar water. If you got excess of this product left over, you know, Andrew, you said refrigeration. It's best to use it fresh. Um, probably best not to add anything to it. Uh, I would think my my concern would be, and you're a better one to answer this. If you added something as a preservative that was very strong, that could have some negative impacts possibly on. On it, we don't know. I don't know. That, that, that that's it. So I don't have like as far as the common preservatives like bleach uh, and essential oils. I don't have that data um, to to give you any advice there. I I don't personally myself uh, in in my own beekeeping I don't use preservatives. Um, so it wasn't a part of the it wasn't a part of the formulation to take that uh, in, into account. The, uh, the idea behind these is to mix up what you need uh, and feed it mm-hmm. fresh. It, it, it needs to be viewed as, as food. Yeah. But, yeah, um, if you do end up with a little bit left over, uh, refrigeration will, will help you out there. So I've got a question from Spirit of Toad. How can we help as citizen scientists? Well, I think if... That's, you know, I, I, absent the word scientist, but this citizen effort um, is exactly what I'm engaged in. It's exactly what guys like Etienne Tardif uh, are engaged in. Um, there, there's a lot of citizen science, you know, happening in this space right now. And I think we need the research community. Uh, we, we need to understand the mechanisms at play. And those experiments are very important. But what you always need at the end of the day is you always need to boil that down to a practical application. Like somebody has to take all of that information and they have to analyze it and turn it into functional tools. And the yes. research community uh, is, they typically don't do that. That's not what they do. They're professional scientists, right? So what that's where I think uh, us as curious beekeepers can get involved and get engaged and that's literally been my my effort for the last decade is to be a citizen scientist i'm pretty reluctant to use the word scientist with with my name in the same same sentence but uh, but that effort that citizen science effort i think it's it's absolutely huge well you said it right there and and uh, earlier is where 
one of the biggest issues that researchers have, and some of them are, are, are get quite frustrated with it, and I, um, but they they are kind of limited to a degree on being able to bring product to the industry. Um, some of them want to, but it's it's a it's a tricky process when you are a scientist with through a university to bring that about because that's really technically not why they're there and hired um, to create products. It's it's to create um, information and, and collect data and 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 produce those papers and 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 bring us important education hopefully, but. Their, their jobs really aren't to design product and, and then bring that into the industry. They're sp- I think what they're supposed to do probably is educate us so that we hopefully as an industry can take the tools that they provide and then, and then go and get something. And that's part of the, the responsibility on, on our end is to seize what we've learned and, and to, to go capitalize with it. But uh, there's several several, several products that I know of in the pipeline at some of these universities, and they have great information that could turn into some great mite treatments or small hive beetle treatments for us here in the South, but they're never going to see the light of day unless a big investor comes along and wants to work with them because, you know, the university is not going to fund that. And I, I don't think that it's really fair to at least what I've understood from listening to some of the researchers, um, for them, they could put all kinds of work into it, and the university still owns a lot of all the stuff. And so why bust your rear end to create something that you're not even going to see the most of or maybe hardly any benefit from it at all? So I, I, there's a lot to all of these things that's complicated, and I think that's why, again, it's important Um, that we work in tandem, understanding that they're a very important part of our industry, but we also have to fulfill our roles um, on our side of things. And I think that's that's the important marriage where we've maybe in the past have separated those entities out where, you know, we can't work together, but I think quite the opposite um, to that point. So what happens if... Apis Biologics gets into your honey supers and is bottled, Andrew. <laughs> that's a, that's a question down there. So, um, don't let that happen. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Don't let that happen. So, whether let's take Apis Biologics biocontrol out of the equation. Uh, don't let sucrose syrup make its way into your honey supers and your bottles or anything that you put in your sucrose syrup. So, it would really be the same uh, precautionary, you know, management. Uh, practices that you would employ so honey contamination is not not ideal mm-hmm. so, so what would happen um you know the honey would be the sucrose syrup would be made into a honey-like substance and it would be uh, adulterated you know honey mm-hmm. here's here's a question for you um One of the folks says, I've started adjusting the pH of my um, apis syrup with citric acid. Um, What do you think about acids and and all that kind of stuff, Um, Andrew? Because there's a lot of talk about those things, and and obviously acid um, has important roles, but I I know just enough to be dangerous with that. Is there anything that you can kind of shed some light on, on nectars when they come into the hive and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, maybe just kind of cursory level because I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a chemist. So I'll, I'll kind of be reserved in my, in my statements there. But so pH does come into play uh, in the chemistry of nectar and pollen. Um, there is some pH challenges when we're feeding sucrose syrup. Uh, typically it will end up a little bit higher on the pH scale than what you would find coming in naturally from nectar. Um, so in theory, there's some beneficial, you know, it would be benefit to bringing that pH down into a more ideal range. I say that with a cautionary undertone because more research on that is needed on, you know, what, what the ideal um, acidifying agent would be. Like, so how do we, how do we bring the, the pH down? Uh, so citric acid is being referenced uh, there. So there's some, basically no reason why I'm, I'm trying to exercise a degree of, caution is because there's some research publications where they've uh, adjusted the, the sucrose syrup pH and have had detrimental effect. 
but they're using certain molecules to bring that, that pH down in those research publications. There's other research publications where they've used other classes of compounds to bring the pH down to a more nectar uh, honey range, and there's beneficial effects. The intestinal villi, um, it was, there was a whole host of uh, beneficial effects observed. So what the ideal agent is that brings the, uh, brings the pH down, what's the ideal pH range, um, more, more research is needed on that. Mm -hmm. The reason I think pH is important um, in the absence of making hard recommendations or why I think it's important is because of when, when you look at biochemistry in, in general or the, the, the biology of pathogens versus uh, probiotics, so, so good microbes versus bad microbes, generally speaking, there's a tendency for pathogenic organisms to proliferate better in a more alkaline environment, right? Not necessarily alkaline, but not acidic. Um, there's a tendency for a healthy microbiome or beneficial organisms. Most of the beneficial organisms produce short chain fatty acids or, or lactic acid or acetic acid. They're, they're typically acid producers, most of the beneficial organisms. And then in the gut of most hosts, it's a fairly acidic environment because of the production of those short chain fatty acids and uh, lactic acid producing bacteria, uh, lab uh, bacteria. So it's, a, so it's an acidic environment. So I have a, a bit of a hypothesis around that and it would need to, we need more research to bear it out. But I think that there's probably detrimental effects to feeding honeybees large volumes of high pH sucrose syrup and what I, what I would what I want to know more about is what effects does that have uh, on the intestinal microbiota of the honeybee? Are we shifting? Are we shifting? And pollen substitute is in in a in a very similar way uh, too high on the on the pH scale compared to uh, natural pollen. So our artificial feeds are are more alkaline than their natural diet. The, I guess the question I would like a more more clear answer to is. Does that provide, does that impact the gut microbiota of the honeybee in a negative way? Does it make the, the microbiota, does it make the environment, the intestinal environment, more susceptible to pathogenic organisms because it's less, less acidic? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm interested in buffering, you know, pH ranges uh, because of that question. Ah, that's, that sounds like a, a really good topic to, to learn more about. And, um, when it comes to that microbiome, if it's not functioning properly or if we're feeding a bunch and it's disrupting its efficiency, then we're not getting the good stuff digested properly, and that's going to affect overall um, health long term. We need these things available to our bees. Um, I had a question directed towards me from Three Boys Bees. Came in, how, how can you tell the apis is, um, these products are beneficial? Uh, more brood, more bees, more honey. So... Um, as far as the honey one goes, um, you know, I don't feed a lot of it prior to the honey flow. Um, typically, one of, one of the areas that we do well in Tennessee is we have typically very good pollen in early spring, um, late late winter, early springs. We have good diversity, and we also um, don't have the, the, the coldest winters. So winter is not a big deal where i'm at i i've argued this for a while and some people don't like me for it but if you're losing bees in winter in tennessee you didn't do something right in july august and september there's no reason why in our very mild winters um the cold should be ki is killing your bees unless you, the lid's off and they're getting rained on or something like that healthy healthy bees should overwinter here very very easily um, so I don't feed a lot coming out of winter because that good nutrition. Uh, I fed a couple pounds of the bioactivator, and I did feed a little bit of um, of the bio control and the sugar syrup. But I really don't like using that as an indicator. The bees consumed it all very well. The patties were eaten very, very good, and there's very little waste on the bottom board. But that wasn't just because of the bioactivator added to the patties. You know, Global does make a good patty too. Um, so there's a lot more to it than just this. Um, but they were – some patties that I've used in the past, you see more debris on the bottom board. And so you want to see a very 
colonies across the board and that's where you know we're not test looking at one or two hives we're we're looking at a hundred at a time and seeing how uniformly they're eating this stuff but in spring i don't really base my opinions at all in winter buildup and spring because that there's a lot of good nutrition what i base all of my opinions on a product is the dearth period after we've been into a dearth for at least a month and so there's been a decent bit of nutritional stress um, what's going on i feed pollen patties in our summer uh, i don't necessarily feed them every week but I, I i feed them every other week at the the low end and last year i was splitting bees in august and it was not just because i was using andrew's product we were also making sure that they never ran low on um, food and in any form and, and we've done this in the past, but I, what I look for is how much royal jelly is down in the cell in August when we're in the peak of our dearth, you know, mid-August. We don't have – we haven't had pollens coming in for – our pollen count goes down big time by the end of May, early June. And so – by the time August rolls around, it's been a long time since we've had healthy pollens in large quantities. So I'm looking in August and I'm seeing, are the bees growing good? Am I getting really good patterns? And and Andrew will be the first to tell you, and I will tell you this as well, there's a heck of a lot more going on than just the supplement. I've got young queens in my colonies. I have good, plenty of nutrition. Um, I also am controlling my mites very good. But when I, and this is one of the advantages of being a, a little bit larger than a hobby operation is I can buy this stuff in larger quantities. And at the conference, we were able to get global patties for around $1.62 a pound for the 4% pollen. So that's that's quite a good price, and that was with Andrew's product added to them. And so that's one of the advantages of coming to Hive Life, and that's one of the advantages of being able to buy in bulk um, is that you know, it's not costing me that much more, and I, I'm seeing more jelly, and I'm seeing good, healthy colonies. Um, I'm not a researcher. I can't make any claims. All I can give you is the eyeball test, and, and I can tell you right now this is – I had wonderful overwintering success, but there was a lot more going on than than just these products right here. So uh, That's a really good point, Kevin, and I just kind of want to reiterate that. What I would, you know, encourage every anybody to do is – to really get good at beekeeping uh, before you look to uh, products. To, to what I what I think I've been able to kind of bring to the table here is, you know, an extra ten percent. You know, after you already have your management system dialed in, it's giving you that nutritional edge to eke out that you know next little bit of you know few performance metrics that you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> but there's nothing you can buy in a package anywhere that's going to make you a good beekeeper. You first have to, you know, get good at being a beekeeper in your area. And then you can look to, you know, providing those nutritional edge support. You know, I'm not trying to discourage anybody from, you know, using my products, obviously, but I think it's of paramount importance to uh, learn the craft first, most importantly. Uh, absolutely. I get a lot of questions on, you know, not just supplements, but also insulated hives and in, or just an insulated lid and, and the advantages. And, and I mean, all you have to do is look at our households and look at the energy savings from having a well-insulated house versus a non-insulated house. Bees are used in their bodies and they're using honey and they're using pollen to, to make more bees. Um, and th- so if they're using their bodies, they're wearing through their resources and and their lifespan to either cool or heat the hive at these crucial times of the year so you can make i think a legitimate argue that there are some serious benefits to having insulated hives um i don't think it's a 50 percent increase or 80 percent i've kept bees almost my entire life without any insulated hives um not my entire life i didn't start when i was one but you know the 21 years of my beekeeping life um and i think that there is an edge gained with the insulation, but I've seen dead bees in insulated hives before and seen good bees in, um, in wooden boxes. So uh, I think Andrew put it, it, it's all about getting that edge. And I think especially for those who are looking to, to push things to the peak, that's, 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 that's what I'm looking for with my operation 
is, is to push that one step further. And Robin Martin asks, so best time to use biologics, Cayman, is when you want to build a population, fall or spring. A little bit in my spring. And I, if I'm going to spend, like say I, I'm budgeting here, and I don't have enough money to feed it throughout my entire dearth period or every time that I would like to, then personally I'm just going to use a tiny bit on that first push coming out of winter, and then I'm going to spend the majority of my money on those rough periods in summer and fall um, building those winter bees because I feel like for my area that is the most crucial period um, because we're going into a long period of dearth, which is winter, and so I need the, the best, healthiest bees of the year for that. Whereas if I'm feeding going into s- late winter, spring, I'm going into the best parts of the season. So if I'm needing an edge and I have to pick and choose, I'm spending in the fall. One thing that hasn't been talked about a lot is important is we have small hive beetles here in the south. Andrew does not up in Canada, or they don't have much in Canada anyways. Some parts I, I hear there's little bits and pieces, but th- those little devils get their butts frozen off every year up there. Um, yeah. I, I love that. Uh, <laughs> I wish we can see a big difference in Tennessee when we have a, a legitimate winter. We see significant impacts in survivability on small hive beetles and how quickly they build up. Uh, down here so we actually look forward to a, a, a hard i look forward to a harder winter here for that reason alone but the small hive beetles down here we have to be careful with these pollen patties because they really look forward to this stuff too that those beetles they don't really care about honey they want proteins and fats and so andrew's basically making a wonderful small hive beetle feed too um, so if you're trying to make small hive beetles this stuff is the best stuff for them um But what we do is we take it on a per case basis. If I'm going to a colony in, let's say, July, and it's double deeps, I mean, it's just ripped, and we're wanting to keep it that way, then I'm going to feed a full pound of patty to that thing on that visit. And I'm going to cut that patty into strips. Usually the global patties are about this big, and you know they're about eh, a little bit more than a quarter inch thick, somewhere around there. That's a pound patty. It takes more time, and it's a pain. But thankfully with the Global, it's very easy to pull off the parchment or whatever paper, paper they use for that. Um, maybe it's wax paper. And I'm going to keep one side with and one side without. And then I'm going to cut that into four long strips. And then I'm going to make sure to put that between the boxes and the, uh, between the brood areas. And then in a single, it would be on top. And all of my lids have shims because I need my bees to be able to get up and guard the top of that patty. The worst thing is for bees not to be able to guard part of the patty and the beetles can get to that and lay eggs where the bees can't pull those eggs off and any young larvae that start. A strong colony will control those things if they can gain access to it. So a lot of it for us is making sure the bees can patrol the patty and also more surface area so if i have four slices they can get there's more surface area and they'll consume that much faster i also find um global patties um i get higher and faster consumption rates than i did when i was doing the ultra b ones um now there's prices to think of so i back before i could get global for a reasonable price um I was using Ultra Bee because it just it wasn't cost effective for my business. Um, so, anyways, I kind of got on a little tangent there, Andrew. I'm just, I'm just trying to provide a little context because my biggest concern is we get new beekeepers that come in here, especially if they're in like Florida or Alabama, where small high beetles can be really bad, and they just they they watch part of this video and they throw yeah. a pound of patty in there on an eight frame colony, and it, that's too much in a summer here, you know. So for a smaller one, we would obviously feed less patties. Um, but, yeah, I'm, um, glad, I'm glad that we don't have that problem up here to manage. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, there's a lot of people that have come in like, wow, I made a live stream and all of that stuff. Um, Ian says, Global makes a great patty, a good patty. I fed other commercial store-bought patties, which I, I tossed in the bushes. Um, I've been really pleased with it. Um I, I po- posted a picture, 
and probably a lot of people that clicked this link to get to this video saw the picture for the thumbnail, and it was the Global Patties with Andrew's uh, product in them. And seeing the bees consume them like that is, is exactly what I want to see every time. The bee and the bees have pollen coming in right now. They're consuming it like that with pollen coming into the hive. That also tells me that the bees um, find it desirable um, as well. Um, let's take one or two more questions. And Andrew, I know it's it's getting late your time. Um, I didn't even know there was such thing as Atlantic time until you told me that. Um, so I guess you're on the far east side of Canada, correct? Not quite. Not quite. We have Nova Scotia, Prince, Prince Edward Island, and uh, Newfoundland would be east of us. But, uh, but we are we are east. Okay, you're. East enough to have uh, an Atlantic Atlantic coastline. <laughs> wow, wow, that's 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 bizarre. That's I've really enjoyed getting to learn more about uh, the Canadians through all this uh, live chat and stuff. I think we had f f f Laurel told me somewhere around thirty something minimum Canadians show up to Hive Life this last year, and uh, that was cool. A lot of them brought some. Um, some of them brought products down, like you, and and there's some of the individuals brought. Um, things down as well that they either built to show off. Some of them donated to the silent auction. Um, that was awesome. And and thanks for saying, Robin, that Robin Martin. Um, Andrew, you, you've done awesome. I, I know you weren't expecting a live chat tonight, um, but um, I think you've done really well. And thanks for answering all of our random questions. I know some people probably weren't able to get, we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but I hope that um, you were able to get a lot of your questions answered. And, and this has been two hours long, so there's a good chance that it was answered early on in the video. I think a lot of the meat and potatoes, we hit that early, and then we, we took more of the random stuff towards the end. So hopefully hopefully my responses were clear and I, I answered the questions you know, succinctly. But if anybody you know wants uh, more information, you can certainly reach out to us by, by email. Again, my response time, there's... There's typically a little bit of a lag there, uh, but I but I do get to those emails. I'm absolutely well, and I, I I've got some questions. I'll I'll continue to ask you, and and if early on you talked about having kind of an itemized list of of different things that um, you find useful, and if you don't mind sharing that with me, I'll, I'm going to try to present that on our social media platforms. And, and we, we appreciate you giving us a lot of insight outside of your products. There's been a lot of tips that you've given us, especially early on in the videos that um, show us different ways that we can help ourselves with other products that are already available to us. Um, I want to say a big thanks to Southern uh, Cali Beekeeper. And thanks for supporting us, Southern Cali Beekeeper. We really appreciate you a lot for coming on and all that kind of stuff. Um, folks, Leave some questions um, afterwards in the comments. Um, we This might not be the last time we have Andrew on. If I have anything to say about it, it won't be. And I know Andrew's one of those crazy guys that never stops, so that it won't be uh, too long, and there's going to be something new that we're going to have to talk about. So thanks, Mike Hill, for coming on. Andrew, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day. Thank you so much for um, investing your time into the bee industry. And we are going to leave links in this video for anyone who wants to learn more about his website and where his distributors are throughout North America. And Andrew, is, is there anything at the end of this that you want to say that you can leave us that you know will just feel a lot more enlightened and profoundly affected? Well, I think the answer to that question is no, uh, but I but I would like I, I would like to say that I, I appreciate the support to date uh, for, for this project. And what, what I would like to commit to everybody to do is to continue to dig into the details, continue to improve these formulations. And we will be looking to work with research teams to get the answers to some of these questions that need, need some more, more clarity. I would like to, King and you and I have had some really good discussions on this, and I know we share similar views. Um, if if Apis Biologics finds a place in the market um, and there's revenue uh, left over, like we become profitable, my end game or my goal is to, I, I'm into honeybee research. I'm into honeybee nutrition. Like that's what I want to do. And that's really why I hope we're successful as a, as a company uh, is because I'll be able to spend it all 
uh, on, on honeybee research. <laughs> I, I, I understand that feeling. And if you, if you think I'm kidding, you can talk to my wife. <laughs> you know, I, I would be really fascinated to meet her next, next year. And you, you tell her this, I hope she's watching this. Um, tell her that it was just a shame that you went down and vacationed in Sevierville, Tennessee, one of our vacation destinations in the Smokies. And didn't, and didn't bring her to the conference with you. I, um, Wow. She, 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 pop, she popped in. She go, popped go, in. Go. Oh, okay. Well, smart man. May, maybe there's hope for you yet. Uh, <laughs> good move, Andrew. Good move. Um, indeed. indeed. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, this won't be the last time. Let us know if there's anything um, as Hive Life or just me personally that we can do to um, put you in touch with um, whether it's researchers, I don't have all the answers, but we do know a couple folks that know stuff. And you just reach out if there's anything that we can do. And thank you, Andrew. Um, you have a great evening. You as well, sir. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next video.